Hello everyone and welcome to another video. In this video we'll have a look at the games from the Global Chess League. Alright, so we had some pretty exciting matchups today. For example, here we had the game between Ali Reza Faruja and Hikaru Nakamura. So let's have a look at what happened. Now before this game, Faruja was in great shape. He was on 5.5 points out of 6 games. And Hikaru had a bit of a slower start. He was on 3 points out of 6 games. Anyway, let's have a look at what happened. Faruja opened the game up with the move c4, the English opening. And here black has a lot of options. For example, you can play c5, the symmetrical English, e5, this turns the game into a bit of a reverse Sicilian, or the move that Ikaru chooses, the move e6, aiming to go for a very solid setup with pawn to d5. Now here white can go d4, go back into d4 category uh, territory, but Faruja plays the move g3, and with this move, he's starting the anti catalan Usually if you play the catalan you have a pawn on d4, uh, but here white is delaying that move, and that does give black some extra options. For example, sometimes black can take this pawn over here, or push his own pawn to the d4 square. But Ikaru goes for a very solid setup. He goes for knight of six, knight of three, and bishop e7. All right, so Faruja castles, Hikaru as well. And here, the main move by far and large is the move d4. This turns the game back into a Catalan. But I guess Faruja wanted to play something original, wanted to take Hikaru out of book perhaps, and he played the move pawn to d3. All right, so at first glance, this move is not looking too ambitious, but it's keeping a lot of play in the position. And Ikaru goes for a very solid pawn to b6, aiming to go for a setup with bishop to b7. All right, so Faruja takes on d5, and Ikaru recaptures with the knight. And here, a little bit surprisingly, Faruja plays d4, so he's lost the move, d3 and d4, but by doing so, he has the knight Hikaru some of his options. Anyway, here white still has chance for an advantage, as he wants to go e4 quickly, and build a big center. So bishop e7, and here Faruja goes e4 right away, perhaps a little bit too quickly, as now Hikaru goes knight of six, attacking the pawn on e4, and white doesn't have a good way to defend it. So Faruja is forced to push his pawn up to e5, but now Hikaru gets a very nice a very nice square on d5 for his knight. Now here Faruja goes pawn to h4. So with the pawn on e5, he has more space on the king side, and he wants to use that extra pace, space to go for an attack. So with h4, maybe he wants to go knight g5, maybe queen h5, and again, start a big attack on that side of the board. So Hikaru goes knight d7, knight c3 by Faruja, offering a trade of knights, and here Hikaru decides to take on c3, and plays c5, putting pressure on white's center. All right, so Faruja goes knight g5, offering a trade of bishops, and perhaps aiming to go queen h5. So Hikaru trades on g2, Faruja recaptures, and Ikaru takes on d4. Faruja recaptures with the pawn, and here, a pretty nice move by Ikaru. He plays the move at knight to b8. So not only is he clearing up the d5 square for his queen to give a check, he also wants to go knight to c6 to put a lot of pressure on that pawn on d4. But Faruja plays queen f3, hitting the rook in the corner, which is a little bit awkward to deal with, because you don't want to play knight d7 back, then you're just losing time. Knight a6 also looks a little bit clumsy, the knight on the edge of the board. And here Hikaru's best move, but it's not a move that's easy to find, is the move queen to d7, sacrificing a full rook, but if you take the rook, black goes a knight to c6, and the queen is actually trapped. And even though white is getting two rooks here for the queen, black is much better as the queen is working much better than the two rooks, and, and black uh, has great chances here. All right, but Hikaru instead plays the move queen to d5, offering a trade of queens, but after takes takes, now black has this isolated pawn on d5, which is a little bit weak. So here Faruja comes up with a pretty nice move. He goes knight to h3, aiming to go knight f4 and put pressure on that pawn on d5. And Ikaru plays knight c6, hitting the pawn on d4. All right, so here perhaps Faruja should have played bishop to b2 to defend the pawn on d4, maybe also add some support indirectly to the e5 pawn. But he goes bishop b3, defending the d4 pawn that way. And Ikaru is an excellent defender, and he spots the move f6, putting pressure on white's pawn center right away. Now the only way really for white to hold on to the pawn center is to move f4, but he, that's where you want to go with the knight. So that's not very appealing, that's why he played rook ac1 instead, attacking the knight on c6. Rook ac8 by Karu to defend the knight, and now knight f4 by Faruja, hitting the pawn on d5. Alright, so Karu takes, Faruja takes here, and bishop to a3. So very even endgame, we see that both sides have two rooks, a knight, a bishop, and one, two, three, four, five pawns each. But it still feels like Faruja is a tiny bit better. His pieces are slightly more active, and that's why he's pushing for the win. All right, so rook c3, Ikaru takes on d4, leaving 
uh, his own bishop hanging, but attacking the bishop on e3. So Ferruja recaptures with his bishop on d4, knight takes d4, and rook takes a3. Again, this pawn on e7 is a little bit vulnerable. White's knight on d5 is also pretty active. So again, Ferruja is still a tiny bit better. Rook f7, rook d1 by Ferruja, hitting the knight on d4, knight f5, and h5. Making it difficult for black to gain more space on the king side. Because Ikaro goes g6 anyway, but now after takes takes, his pawn on g6 is a little bit vulnerable. So g4 by Ferruja, hitting the knight. And here Hikaru goes for knight to e7. He's sacrificing the pawn on e7, but Hikaru has correctly evaluated that after Ferruja takes the pawn, they get into this rook and game. But this rook and game with correct play is a draw. And so Hikaru plays rook to c2, attacking the pawn on a2. Rook d7, king up. And Ferruja for the moment is hanging on to the pawn. But the thing is with two pawns versus one on one flank, it's a pretty straightforward draw, especially at this level. So what Ikaru just needs to do is trade off the B pawn for the A pawn, and then, again, he should hold very easily. So he goes rook B2, king G3, G5, fixing the pawn structure on the king side. And now after king F3, he goes B5. Again, he wants to trade off the pawns on the queen side, as then he is very confident that he will hold the draw. So check, king back, rook here, king up, B4, king back, rook B6. So they trade the A pawn for the B pawn. And again, right now, it should just be a pretty easy draw. I mean, Ferruja, of course, is going to push. He gives a check. Oh, apparently... Okay, the computer is giving this a question mark, but it's actually completely fine. There's no win for white. So check, king back, check, king here. Again, Ferruja is pushing for the win, but again, this is a very easy draw for Hikaru. So nothing really that can happen here. He's playing good defense. And um, yeah, you can try with white. Of course, black is not going to trade into the pawn in game, as then he'll be down a pawn, and uh, and white should be winning. So Ferruja, again, he's trying, but there's really not much you can do. Again, Ikaru, of course, not trading out the rooks. King here, rook c5, and uh, wait, rook c5. Ikaru thought here for a second, and he was like, wait, let me trade the rooks. Because after king takes, king e5. And even though black is down a pawn in this king and pawn game, white is completely lost because the white king is on the wrong side. Black is first to go here and pick up these pawns. So shockingly, Ferruja for the longest time was trying to win this endgame with an extra pawn. But now he's actually losing. Because, I mean, again, there's nothing you can do. If you go here, black goes here. And black is always going to be faster to pick up these pawns on the king side. And if you try to run back, you'll also be too late. Like here, king of four... Black takes here, and you're not in time to get the opposition. So here it's a very straightforward win for black. You just go king here, and then you roll out the red carpet for the pawn. So shocking loss for Ferruja, who's had an amazing event so far. But a very tough loss here for him against uh, Hikaru. Yeah, he should have never lost this game. But these things can happen. And so Hikaru gets a nice win for his team. All right, so let's have a look at the other big matchup of today, which was the game between Magnus Carlsen and Maxime Vachelagraf. Magnus Carlsen, he, he needs no introduction. Of course, he's still the best player in the world. Maxime Vachelagraf, very strong player from France. Also back in the day, he was rated over 2800. He's uh, dropped a little bit in the classical ratings, but still an extremely strong player. Anyway, let's have a look at what happens. Magnus goes pawn to d4, and MVL, true to his style, plays the Grunfeld defense. In recent years, he's also played the Queen's Gambit accepted. But the Grunfeld really is his bread and butter. He's played for so many years, ever since his childhood. Uh, and here the main move for white is to move knight c3, aiming to build a big center followed by pawn e4. And so uh, MVL's defense is to move d5, stopping white from going e4. White can take and now go e4. And yes, white gets a pretty impressive center, but black very quickly goes bishop g7, c5, knight c6, puts a lot of pressure on these central pawns. And again, that's really the idea of the Grunfeld. All right, so Magnus has other ideas. He goes for the move h4, a very combative move. Now d5 no longer makes as much sense as here white can take, and after knight takes, first of all there's h5, but also after e4 you attack the knight, and the knight cannot trade itself off for a knight on c3, so it's going to have to move and, and black loses time. Alright, so MVL develops with bishop g7, now knight c3 by Magnus, and again he wants to build a big center with e4, and here, again it's not as easy to go d5 anymore, as here white has the very strong h5. So, if black takes the pawn on c4, now h6 is annoying, and the bishop has to step back. This really doesn't look good for black. I mean, already white is having a big advantage. 
And well, if you take that pawn on h5, now white takes here. And again, white gets a pretty strong center followed by e4. So this is also why uh, d5 is not played here. So MVL, again, uh, by his nature, he's a, he's a Grunfeld player. But here he sees himself forced to switch in a different direction. He goes d6, going into the direction of the king's Indian. So long way to go e4, and now knight to c6, putting pressure on the pawn on d4. So knight g2 by Magnus, castles, and here Magnus plays pawn to f3. Because he wants to go bishop to e3, but he doesn't want to be bothered with knight to g4. And here MVL goes for a very direct approach. He goes pawn e5, d5, and knight d4, sacrificing a pawn in the middle of the board. But if white takes, and takes twice, here black has a very nice tactical shot. Black has knight takes e4, hitting the queen in the middle of the board. And if white takes the knight, then black has rook e8, and black wins the queen, and with that, the game. So that is why the pawn on d4 cannot be captured. Instead, Magnus goes bishop to e3, putting pressure on the knight on d4. In case black takes here, white recaptures with either the bishop or the knight. And white is a very pleasant position. You can go queen e2 after, g4, h5. And white is a very pleasant attack on the king's side. So MVL has different intentions. He goes for c5, strengthening his knight in the middle of the board. Now white doesn't want to leave this knight um, here because it's super powerful. It's Again, it's right in the middle of his position. So Magnus takes on croissant on c6. Now here MVL has a choice. He can take with the knight, but now this pawn on d6 is a little bit weak. And white can try to attack it with, let's say, queen d2, followed by queen side castles. So instead of that, he goes pawn takes c6. Again, leaving the knight on d4 hanging. So Magnus takes and takes with the bishop. So here we see that white is up a pawn, but the king is still in the middle. And that's why MVL breaks open the center with the move d5 again. When your king is castled and the opponent's king is in the middle, you want to open up the middle of the board to get access to the enemy's king. All right, so Magnus takes and goes e5, attacking the knight, and MVL goes knight to h5, trying to jump into these weak squares on the king's side, especially the, the square on g3. So Magnus goes king f2, giving up on castling, but he wants to stop that knight g3 jump. But after rook it's really hard to hang on to that extra pawn on e5. So he goes queen e2, Let's MVL get the pawn back, but now he takes and goes queen to d4. So Magnus is saying like, hey, I don't have the safest king here on f2, but you have an isolated pawn on d5, which can be a little bit weak, and I have nice control over the square on d4. All right, so the, the rook is under attack, so MVL goes queen f6 to defend it. Apparently not the most accurate move in the position. Rook d1 by Magnus, activating his rook, putting more pressure over here. Note, by the way, that the pawn on d5 cannot be taken due to rook e2 check and white loses the queen. So with rook d1, white is actually threatening to take as now uh, the queen on d4 is always defended. All right, so bishop b7, g4 attacking the holes. The horse jumps to f4 and Magnus goes rook to e1, hitting the rook on e5. All right, so here MVL played rook to e6, uh, defending his queen on f6 and getting out of the pin. The problem for black is black would like to play rook a8, defending the rook in the middle of the board. But here white has the very strong and clever king to g3. And all of a sudden black is just lost. There's no way to defend against rook takes c5 and queen takes f4, despite black having a very active position. All right, so rook a6, so Magnus trades. But if we have a look at the clock, things are a little bit concerning for Magnus. He's down four and a half minutes on the clock. Yes, he might be a tiny bit better, but there's no increment. The players get 20 minutes for the entire game, no bonus time added per move. So this is the time he has to deal with. So king g3, rook b8, rook h2 activating his pieces, h6, rook d2. Again, he's down a lot of time on the clock. So MVL goes king g7, rook e5, putting some pressure over here. Bishop c6, b3, rook b4, strength, strengthening the knight on the 4 a little bit. Knight e2, and MVL goes rook to e6. All right, so Magnus can trade here, which will lead to an approximately even position. I can go d4 after, and who knows what would have happened. It's most likely that the game ends in a draw, but again, with a time deficit, really anything can happen, and I quite like Black's chances, especially really because of the time. But Magnus goes for an interesting move. He goes knight takes f4, and the point is that after rook takes c5, he has knight d3, forking both of the rooks. So first he gives up an exchange, because now... He is guaranteed to win material back. But MVL goes rook to d4. So here he is spinning the knight on d3. So if white takes on e5, black takes on d2. White can take on c6. This is what Magnus had to do. Where now he's getting a knight and a bishop for the rook. But black takes here. 
And black has rook for the two minor pieces and he also has a pawn. So it feels like this should be a draw with correct play. If anything, I think white still has chances to push for the win. But shockingly, Magnus goes for rook to c2. He thought like, hey, I'm attacking the bishop and the rook in e5. But MVL just thought for a second and found rook e6. Saving the rook, saving the bishop. And all of a sudden, Magnus is just down a rook for a knight. A full exchange. Besides, he's, he's down more than four, four minutes on the clock. So things are looking really bad for him. Goes king of two, a5. MVL just slowly but surely improving his position. Rook of six, hitting the pawn on f3. Also putting pressure over here. All right, rook of four. Rook b4. Rook b6 back. And again, especially if you look at the time here, six minutes against one and a half, it is not looking good for Magnus Carlsen. F4, F6, pushing the knight away. Rook E3, A4, opening up more files for the rooks, creating more weaknesses for white. MVL, very smooth technique here. King F2, attacking the rook, but he does not care. He's just, he goes A takes B3, giving up the rook on E3 because if white takes, there's B2, and white is forced to give up the rook for the pawn. So Rook D1, B1, Queen, takes, takes. Again, blacks up the exchange, and this pawn on A2 is also going to drop in the foreseeable future. So knight D4, attacking the bishop, just bishop B7, G5. The pawns were traded here, but after rook B2, again, this pawn on A2 is simply going to drop. Bishop here, MVL takes, king of 4, king of 7, king E7, shouldering the white king, allow not allowing it uh, further into the black position. Bishop here, rook here, threatening to give check. King of 4, bishop A6, offering the trade of bishops. And after king to d6, Magnus resigns. So a shocking loss for Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces. Credit to MVL who played a really good game, both on the board and on the clock, and fully deserved to win. And that also meant that his team went on to win this match. So I hope all of you guys enjoyed the, the game analysis. If we have a quick look at the standings, we see that the PBG Alaska Knights is still in the lead with six match wins out of uh, seven matches. Then in shared second place, we have Ferruja's team and Magnus's team with uh, 12 points, four match wins out of seven matches. And Ikaru's team still has a chance to make the top two. You need to make it into the top two to qualify for the playoffs. Uh, so the PBG Alaska Knights, that, that's uh, the team of Anish Giri, is looking very good. Ferruja's team and Magnus's team also have a good chance. And Hikaru's team perhaps still has a chance as well. Anyway, hope you guys and hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. I will be live every single day on this YouTube channel covering the games of the Global Chess League. So I will see you guys tomorrow. Looking forward to seeing all of you and uh, see you also in the next video.